Welcome to OzCast, the platform where we take a deep dive into the science and research behind the issues impacting Australian waterways. Each week, we team up with experts in their field to take a look below the surface. Well, Dominic, welcome to OzCast. We find ourselves here at the uh, the University of Adelaide, and I must admit, this is the uh, the most makeshift studio we've had. We are in a room surrounded by oysters, shellfish, uh, pictures, diagrams, every book on it, and you're even wearing an oyster shirt. Welcome to my oyster world. <laughs> Just in case. Fantastic. You, yeah. Now this is this is really exciting. Um, I said it uh, offline that uh, in my time at Oldsfish, particularly, the buzzword is around shellfish. Particularly, of course, we're going to get to one of the programs that you, you know you, you, you're aware of and we've been working on. But um, even talking to you over a coffee, you, it sounds like you're working on um, some really exciting things. I want to chat about those. I want to chat about the importance of, of oysters and shellfish, a bit of the history if we can. Um, and in particular, some of the weird and, and wacky things you've done in your time um, in the last 10 years or so around your research Um uh, something to do with sound, I think, is what we're going to get to. And there's a machine under me at the moment in this desk that I think we might be able to refer to. But firstly, thanks for jumping on. Um, uh, have you done a, a, a podcast on, on shellfish before? I assume you've done a bit of media work. Oh, maybe one or two. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I tend to. I dream oysters. You so, dream oysters. yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, this is familiar territory. So take us back to where, where when did oysters and the well, I guess we should clarify. When we say oysters, um, you know, that is a species, I guess, of shellfish, correct? And then when we refer to shellfish, we're referring to them all generally. Um, is that the best way to put it for the for the next 60 minutes or so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, shellfish covers all manner of beasts, uh, yeah. which typically have a couple of shells, but some people also call shelf lobsters and so forth, shellfish. Right. Um, oysters is a, another umbrella term, actually. There's a ton of different species. Some are true oysters, some are, some are slightly different um types of bivalves that are similar to oysters so it's uh let's just call them oysters and um right we'll, everyone will be comfortable home. yeah when, when you hear the word oysters we're referring to them generally so um yeah take us back for, for someone that's been so entrenched in a world of what i would call a niche world i mean you did say you've read every book on the subject not many people can say that um where did not it many all, books to read yeah where did it all start for you how did you go from studying or, or, or looking for something to study to then now being known as when I put the word out to my colleagues as I need to talk to someone who knows all about shellfish and oysters, your name popped up first. How does that, how does that happen when you, you know, I must admit you're relatively young in, in terms of this industry, which I find is filled with a lot of, you know, of the older generation who have, who I think it's a dying industry generally is that marine ecology, fish ecology stuff, you know, and we've had that conversation before on this platform. So how do you find yourself at, at 40 or just just over, you know, being being the one that everyone refers to as the oyster man. Yeah, only just over. Yeah. Uh, it's not <laughs> well and truly called over. young. Um, <laughs> certainly not feeling it. Uh, so I was, I did a Bachelor of Science at university. I just loved the environment. I didn't know what I was going to do with my career. Um, but, uh, but I spent a lot of my 20s traveling around the world trying to get lost in nature. Uh, so when I had the opportunity to study as a mature age student, it's environmental science, that was that was always going to be what I was going to study. But oysters and even marine ecology weren't necessarily on the radar. Um, it was when I came to the end of my undergraduate degree and I was looking for something to spend a year on, my, my honours, spend my honours uh, year on. Uh, I came across a paper published in 2011. So this was in 2012, just a few months after it was published, on the historic uh, loss of, of oyster reefs worldwide, something like 85% of oyster reefs um, decimated across the globe. And that just blew my mind. And what particularly blew my mind was that on this map of loss around Australia, it was marked as functionally extinct. And that didn't make any sense to me because I grew up uh, primarily on the east coast of Australia, spent a lot of time at the beach. And, you know, oysters are almost so ubiquitous there. They're almost just part of the bedrock. They're everywhere, encrusting rocky shorelines. And so, yeah, it was, um, it, was, it was recognition that that's not representative of what these reefs actually used to be. So I want to dig a bit deeper and tell the story. And then it's all, it's all well and good to say that, you know, you wanted to, to dive into it. And then how long have you been kind of been in the industry now 10 years 20 years how much time have you devoted to this topic too much <laughs> i've aged <laughs> rapidly over the last decade so that was back in 2012 okay um 
And, and at that time, so I knew next to nothing about oyster ecosystems, and few people did. There was very little scientific literature, which was actually looking at what they did for the environment. There was a, there was a good amount of literature from the United States, but not so much in Australia. Um, but there was this really well-established and economically significant oyster industry. So that was a good place to start. And right. I, was, I was reading and learning all about oysters and, and what we knew through the, through the oyster industry. Um, but back in 2012, the application for oyster ecology really wasn't clear. And I remember, I remember a, a colleague, a fellow honours student saying, you know, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> And, and at the time, I was wondering, yeah, well, I wonder who will care. Um, but within a few short years, that the appreciation of this ecosystem as, an, as a valuable part of the Australian coastal ecosystem uh, was, um, yeah, the appreciation had completely changed. So you mentioned it all started for you when you realised that there was a huge loss, right? Mm. And you said at the time when you discovered it was about 85%. I think it's higher now. Well, mm. you know, there's a few numbers getting floated around. I've heard 95 and things like that. So... Let's start there. You mentioned that in 2012 or around that time, you know, you realized that there was a significant loss. And if you started there, I want to dive into what caused those losses. So when you first started your journey on this, you know, in this industry, the first thing you probably would have looked at is why have we lost so many? How could have this happened in such a, uh, in a country with such a young history? I mean, realistically, we've only been colonized for what, 200, 200 odd years yet we've been able to take away 85% of our biomass in that time. So, 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 so give, us, give us a rundown. How have we done that? What are the causes? What are the different reasons? And, and I want to lead, I want to finish that conversation with a stock take on how many we've actually lost and where we're at right now in 2023. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Um, so, yeah, so Europeans settled Australia in um, uh, about, about um, you know, 240 odd years ago and pretty pretty soon after they started digging up oysters um, tonging them on the shoreline shoveling them uh, from these reefs because they were really nutritious food really valuable for the early European colony um, but they're also a really valuable resource for construction for the construction industry when you burn an oyster shell you can actually manufacture cement so a lot of early colonial buildings were actually laid down using oyster cement um, but it was the oyster dredge that was the that was the the major culprit and uh, these are uh, sort of metal bags pulled along the sea floor using um, uh, wind-powered cutters and they would they would scrape indiscriminately all shells from the sea floor completely denuding it from of of oysters and so that was a killer blow for the oyster reef. So after a few decades of continually scraping these oysters from the seafloor, every oyster, from the little guys to the big guys, um, it, uh, it turned those sort of shelly bottoms, those hard bottom reef habitats into restless, shifting sediment, sedimentary bot bottoms where young oysters couldn't settle anymore. Um, and, and that dredging activity is... We no longer dredge for oysters, but it still continues today for other species. What were we dredging for? Like, what's the main, for those who aren't aware of why we dredge, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the common reasons why they were dredging throughout that time? Well, it's just such an effective and efficient method. Right. Um, and it goes back hundreds of years. So the earliest documentation of dredging goes right back to the 1300s, wow. dredging for oysters. Um, and, and we know that because there was actually a petition written to the king of the, of the time, I think it was King Edward III, uh, in the 1370s, complaining about the destructive nature of these dredges, removing all this, all this habitat from the seafloor, which was at the time recognised as valuable fish breeding habitat. Back right. then, they already knew that these oysters, this convoluted habitat provided the foundations for thriving marine communities beyond the oysters. Mm. They provide a home for all sorts of critters and the natural fish factories. So they knew that all the way back then. It was no, I always find it interesting, the conversation around particularly what the First Nations peoples of Australia knew around 
you know, the productivity of certain habitats. And I remember, you know, I've mentioned it a few times now, but going to visit the, the Bawarana fish traps, one of our guests mm. did that and, and how amazed they were at their understanding of the hydrology and the engineering. And they had no access to universities, you know, they're knowing what professors have studied 40, 50 years, but they, you know, have an understanding that- The original the ecologists. Original, exactly. Yeah. So, so between, you know, uh, basically building with it, breaking it down and then dredging with it, it was consumption a big part of it? Because yeah, I, massive. When I, when I interviewed Anna Clark, who's a historian um, down in Sydney, and, and she touched on it briefly, but she was saying that we started to harvest oysters and not even eat them. They would just crush them. And then there was an, a legislation passed in the late 1800s where you basically couldn't kill live oysters anymore. Mm. And I find that so fascinating mm. that at one point oysters were considered a resource in terms of building an infrastructure before a food. Mm. Like they were using the shells. You know, now we go oysters, eat oyster bar, you know, yep. a few drinks, you know what I mean? You yeah. know, Kilpatrick, whatever you want to call it. But back then it was like harvest first, use for building first, eat second. Yeah. Yeah, some of the first fisheries legislation laid down in Australia was to stop the burning of live oysters because wow. they would literally take these kilns for burning shells mm. down to the sea floor, down to the seashore, establish them on a sand bed right next to an oyster reef and shovel the reef directly into the kiln to burn it down and manufacture that lime. Uh, so that was recognised as quickly, really quickly denuding the beds, <laughs> much faster than, than um, harvesting them for market. Uh, but there were oyster saloons all over, all over Sydney and, and certainly all over Adelaide, where we are here, uh, because those oysters were just such a critical part mm. of the, the nutrition of, of, early, um, of the early colonial settlement. And, and uh, you know, they were for everybody. They were cheap. They were readily accessible. And so people were knocking back oysters every day. Probably goes to show the abundance of them back then. Too. Astonishing. We, if we if they're shoveling them in, yeah. you know, like, can you imagine, do you ever look back and try imagine what it used to be like? Uh, it's, it's impossible to fathom. And that was the first thing that I first tried to find out. You know, are there some images? How can I actually visualize what these reefs look like? Because there's evidence to suggest, uh, and some sort of colonial diaries suggesting that reefs were four meters high and they stretched for kilometers at the time. Some of the early fisheries maps show that these reefs were even far more gargantuan than that. There was a reef that carpeted the majority of Gulf St. Vincent. That's thousands, Gulf St. Vincent just off here, off the coast of Adelaide here. That's thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of hectares of oyster reef scraped and gone within a matter of decades. And there's a map behind me that you referred to, you know, yeah. like is that, yeah, we, you know, I mentioned we're sitting in, um, in Dom's office here. So there was a, I can't quite see it now, but what was the one you were telling me there around, it was that was that it the one in St Vincent there there was a, a reef the size of an island or something like that you were referring to yeah so that that reef is um was, is bloody big when you look at the gulf you're like mm. holy holy yeah, heck yeah, how yeah, could yeah. that be an entire oyster reef system uh we we know that only because of these maps and because of the volume of shell that was being moved by the oyster fishery but there's another map just below you which is far more impressive of an oyster reef 24,000 square kilometers that's about the size of a small, one reef one reef uh off the coast of germany and and yep. denmark and that was from an oyster fisheries map dating to the 1870s and that reef had been fished for hundreds of years. Dredging was actually banned in the Thames in the 1500s, yet they continued to dredge those, the, the, that habitat. It wasn't until we industrialized the dredge, stuck engines on the back of our boats and started relentlessly trawling and we could dredge deeper and, and, and heavier beds that that reef was completely scraped from the sea floor. And now you won't find a single oyster there today. Before we move on from issues, what does, you know, things like increase of sediment and, 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 you know, blocking light and maybe even smothering oyster reefs with the increase of runoff, uh, pesticides, microplastics, all that, you know, the, the increase of, I guess, uh, other things in our waterways, does that have a role to play? Because I know one of the big functions of oysters is, is water filtration. But I've heard that, you know, one of the things that's it's, uh, probably damaging them in Moreton Bay has been the increase of sediment. Yeah, definitely. So, so w w what's that all about? Yeah, it's a suite of impacts. So um, you don't want to simplify it too much. Obviously, the mm. dredging was a major cause, but you also had this massive land use change as we colonised the coast. 
that changed catchments, changed runoff regimes, and changed the amount of sediment that was washing into these into these estuaries. Um, as you got sediment build up, some some of the reefs got smothered, and we don't have any more subtidal reefs. We used to have subtidal Sydney rock oyster reefs. Now they're only intertidal. And for those listening that don't know what that means. Just below, yeah, continuously below the waterline as opposed to between the high and the low. And now low. you're saying we only have the, the For ones the that come high tide, low tide, you yeah. know, exposed, unexposed. And before we used to have ones that were just under the water. Yeah. Oh, we had both. Right. We had sure. both. So they stretched from right down to 40 metres. The flat oysters could, could form habitat at that those sorts of depths right into the upper intertidal. They're amazing beasts. They're incredibly strong. Um, they're incredibly tough. They can they can endure you know really hot conditions in the upper intertidal or really sort of intense um, environments where there's a lot of pressure pressures from from predators and so forth underneath the waves. So yeah, they're they're um, they're they're quite. It's really hard for me to imagine what sort of a role they would have played. Yeah. When I look at a little clump of oysters, maybe the size of a of a baseball, for example, you know, it'll have a thousand plus other little animals living in stomach, in, yeah. in among it, um, belonging to maybe a hundred different species. They're sort of invertebrate mega cities. If you multiply that by the scale of the reefs that we lost, you're talking about so much more biodiversity. They also filter the water. That changes the the um, the turbidity that you mentioned. You know, when you get that sediment runoff, oysters could quickly capture that when they're in abundance. You know, one oyster can filter something like 150 liters of water a day. You multiply that by billions of oysters, you got an efficient um, yeah. set of coastal kidneys that can just keep the water clean. And um, and one of the I guess most extreme examples comes from Chesapeake Bay on the east coast of the US, where they had oyster reefs filling all the tributaries pretty much for, for hundreds of years. Oyster, uh, Chesapeake Bay is the, the largest estuary in, um, in North uh, America. It covers some, the, the watershed com- covers something like 15 US states. It's bloody enormous. And uh, it was all full of oysters and then they were all dredged out. And that led to what we call a, a regime shift where you transition from an ecosystem that was that was dominated by healthy bottom habits, benthic habitats, oyster reefs, seagrass, kelp forests. But as you lost the oysters and you increased sediment that was running into these habitats, you lost that filtration function and then it became quite cloudy. And now there aren't many healthy bottom habitats. It's more about, you know, it's clogged with jellyfish and it's a pelagic system. Sounds like a catch-22. So if sediment, for example, and excess things in the water is, a, is an issue for oysters, well, the more oysters there would be there, they would be filtering that water anyway. So it's like they're helping their own cause by filtering that water. And then as soon as you have, as soon as you start to take the, some oysters away, well, obviously less water is getting filtered, which means there's more sediment, which means the oysters that are there are probably going to be, you know, facing a bigger issue. It's, 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 and you mentioned there before a clump of oysters. I think that's, and you were referring to the baseball analogy. I think it's easy to get lost in the fact that say an oyster might be, well, how, in a baseball size clump, how many potential oysters would be there, you know? Yeah, oh, I mean, how long's a piece of yeah. string? There could be thousands of little, little baby oysters. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you could very easily get, um, you know, I'm holding in my hand a, a clump with about, um, you know, 10 yeah. r- reproductive oysters, reproductively so- And when you oysters. refer to an oyster reef, just with that in your hand now, you're referring to the uh, the idea that they clump together, they join together, and it goes from being yeah. a single oyster to being now, you know, a, re- like a reef. To, to be fair, that is a small reef in some yeah. respect. Yeah, attached to a pneumatophore. So this is these are Sydney rock oysters that you find um, all over sort of mangrove forests up and down the east coast of Australia. But yeah, it's about these reefs were formed by oyster upon oyster upon mm-hmm. oyster growing for hundreds or thousands of years in a particular location. So you had crusts of oyster shell which were meters thick mm. and and of course that was a really attractive yep. um, resource for for construction also for crushing down as fertilizer and and, and other uses so you mentioned the, the importance of them you mentioned obviously uh, water filtration the fact that a, a, an oyster clump that size could be home to thousands hundreds of thousands even millions of, of smaller micro invertebrates and then of course the food chain works the way it does and you've got 
prawns and shrimp and things eating them, which then bring the brim and the snapper and, and our bigger species in. Is there any other role that oysters play in our ecosystems that we should be aware of? Anything that you know people might not or mainstream media might not cover in, in, in as much depth as those first two? Uh, you've, hit the, you've hit the main ones on the head. The capacity to be a natural fish factory is obviously really attractive from a restoration perspective, for example. You know, we've lost reefs that carpeted entire gulfs. If you bring back more oysters, you can bring back the breeding habitat. And, you know, one oyster shell, disarticulated oyster shell, can have, I've found them with, with, with thousands of fish eggs um, laid inside them. And a lot of fish breed directly at, on, on top of these reefs. Uh, one thing that you didn't touch on there is they are a natural breakwater, particularly these intertidal oysters we have on the East Coast, the Sydney rock oyster. They prov provide reefs that can dampen wave energy. And so they can be used to protect coastal infrastructure in the in the right environment. That's no. real. That's that's an interesting one. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was only talking to someone there the other day. I didn't realise that seagrass uh, dampens waves and water movement. Yeah. Just you know, the same way oysters are you know are a natural breakwater. It's funny you you kind of don't give them as much credit as they probably are when they're in such big numbers and there's such you know uh, masses of them. They probably do you know. Uh, divert water and, and stop oh. waves coming in more than we think. Yeah, very much so. And yeah, in, in the US, restoring them as a breakwater to protect coastal infrastructure is big business now. Even the US Army uses oyster reef restoration as a means of protecting their coastal assets. So it's very much on the agenda over there. In, in South Australia, where we have our reefs in deeper water, uh, our restored reefs, uh, that's all about fish productivity and, yep. and, and other attributes. So it depends on the environmental setting, yep. but they're ecological superheroes. You know, where you get oysters, you get more invertebrates, you support the broader food chain, you get more fish, you get more cleaner water. Um, so they're just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal ecosystem. You've mentioned the US twice now. In your research, have you had, have you ever, A, have you ever had the chance to go visit or, or or at least work closely with someone over there to, to see what Australia could do and learn from other countries. You know, there's, there's plenty of conversations I've had, particularly on this platform, around the fact that they've had a jump on us thousands of years in terms of when they were civilised. Surely we can learn lessons from them as to how they've restored their reefs. Or I might be wrong there, and you could say that everyone has probably picked up this whole, you know, We've got to start restoring things at a similar time, you know, in the last, you know, 10 or 20 years. So have you had much to do with the US and what have we learned? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got colleagues that I work with and um, have visited over in the US and we've learned a lot from them. Uh, in terms of the, the deep history, historical ecology, uh, we had indigenous communities sustainably harvesting, managing and even restoring reefs in Australia and in the US for five, six, seven thousand years. There's some great research that's demonstrated that sustainability. Uh, in more recent times with this contemporary restoration, the US has got the jump on the rest of the world because of the manner in which they actually harvest oysters to market. So they've been restoring reefs for about 55 years, but most of those reefs were being restored to maintain the traditional oyster industry, which was to, to harvest those reefs. Whereas when we lost our reefs, instead of transitioning to restoration, we started intertidal aquaculture, which now probably is a more sustainable means. But um, that jump that, you, that the US got has put them far advanced to the rest of the world in terms of oyster reef restoration. So we've been very fortunate to learn a lot from them, collaborated a lot as we started our contemporary restoration work. And I'd say Australia is is also leading the world. Um, the US has been doing it a long time, but Australia's got the jump on many places, such as Europe, where there's about 18 countries that has aspira have aspirations to restore oyster reefs, um, but they're just still on the ground floor. And they really have a keen eye on, on what we're doing down here, particularly in I South Australia. Is the US the one that's doing the Billion Oyster Project? Is that that? Yeah, I'd say that's the flagship right. oyster restoration project around the world. I've, I, I know the guys who, who, um, who run that and I've been over there and, and we've got some cool research collaboration mm. going with them. Um, but that's a phenomenal success story where you have, uh, and a nice vision of the future for me, what I'd, I'd like to see in this country, where you've got high school students, for example, 
uh, growing and tending to oysters off jetties, you know, growing up these oysters, monitoring them, seeing what they do, and then those oysters can graduate to restoration sites. You've got, you know, breweries brewing wow. oyster beer, and you've got little oyster festivals in the city. I mean, it's New York, so it's a hive of activity. Yep. And, uh, yeah, they, they get a lot of support and a lot of recognition now, you know, the oyster restoration is very much on the agenda as a means for providing some of those other, not just by the Billion Oyster Project, but by the New York uh, City. You know, mm. They're trying to restore oyster reefs as a means of dampening some of those storm surges that we've seen over the last few, few years. So there's recognition of the role as critical coastal infrastructure beyond that sort of um, those ecological benefits and, yeah. and emerging educational benefits. As I well. like to know that there's collaboration between countries. I think that's promising. It's you know? critical. I think because oyster reefs here might not directly influence the American population, you know, but uh, I think as a whole, you know, they're all oysters. They're all shellfish. We they're all live sh on the same planet. Yeah, yeah, We've yeah, got exactly. to restore it. And uh, why reinvent the wheel when you can pick up the phone or jump on Zoom these days? So collaboration is really important. It's a very collaborative industry mm. uh, because we are working in a vacuum a lot of the time. You know, we know a lot, but we can always know more. And when it, when it comes to um, oyster ecology, for example, you know, as I mentioned, I've only been, I've been working in this space for about 10 years and there aren't that many people who have generated that much research on oyster mm. ecosystems. They're the forgotten reef. You know, everybody, if you mention reef, it's synonymous with coral reefs, but the oyster reefs were similarly sized. You know, they covered something like 7,000 kilometres of Australian coastline. They're massive ecosystems that have been erased from our memory. The Forgotten Reef. That's you might right. have just found the title for this episode the of the podcast. Reef. I it's love a, it. That's brilliant. So before we get to the whole restoration side of things, I think it's really important to touch on uh, some of the basics when it comes to oysters. I'm going to give you an understanding of what I know and you can correct me, like we're you know, in a classroom, for example. But from my understanding, there's a chemical makeup on the outside of the shell of an oyster, for example, which attracts other shells or other oysters. And... Uh, particularly spat or baby oysters, in order for their kind of regeneration process, they need old shells or a stable substrate of some description. I could be throwing fancy words hand no, you're around right. here. In order to then expand. And that's why you get this clumping um, phenomenon. Yeah. I, I, am I close? Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, you. You pass. Well, I'm interested because, you know, that's a lot of the reason why we do certain restoration techniques is because someone has figured that out and now we're using old shells and we're going to get to, you know, what... what starting, to think, starting to think like an oyster. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. What, what so, so run us through that whole that whole side of things. What is it about, you know, the shell of an oyster that, that attracts and, and, and why is it so important that we utilise old shells for, for new reefs? Yeah, well, one of the reasons why these reefs haven't come back is, as I mentioned, because of that dredging which removed all the shells. And that's what the oysters need to settle on because they provide hard substrate. That's where a baby oyster needs to settle. But they also emit certain cues, chemical cues, olfactory cues, smells that little tiny baby oysters can key into. So there's a particular chemical makeup of the shell as the shell dissolves a little bit in the water. Um, it releases that smell and that can drift on ocean currents and little baby oysters can interpret that and follow that back to the source over wow. short distances. And uh, there's particular aspects of um, that, that chemical makeup, but also the biofilm, that, the, the microbial film that, that forms on top of the oyster shell, that induce an oyster to metamorphose, to transition from its free-swimming larval stage into a, it's it's um, sedentary sort of adult stage. And once it settles down, it's down for life. So it's a pretty big decision. So they need to use as much information as they can, all without a brain. They're pretty amazing. Right. And is it, so, you you know, the particular clump that you've got in front of us now, it's it's on a, what is used to be an, a mangrove. Mangrove root. Yeah, new so metaphor. Can they stick to a range of different kind of? Yeah. Um, structures, uh, pylons on jetties, rocks, uh, mangroves, obviously, by the looks of it. So is there a certain kind of structure they need or has it just got to be hard? Hard is good. Hard is um, good. But there are particular types of hard structure that are particularly attractive. For example, limestone is, mm. has a similar chemical makeup to the shells themselves. But that hard substrate is, 
is is quite critical. And you know, when whenever you see a seawall built, you know that's not a natural habitat. Um, but if you're on the east coast of Australia, you're likely to find an oyster there if it's if it's sheltered enough. It's if it's in an estuary. If you see a jetty pylon, yeah, there's a good chance you'll cut yourself on an oyster if you get too close. So yep. yeah. Hard substrate is um, some sort of hard structure is absolutely critical. That's probably the first element we need to help to bring back these oysters. Yeah. But there's particular features of different habitats, uh, sorry, of different structure, such as the chemical makeup that will induce more settlement. And, and some of the cool techniques that have been used have um, some cool research has shown that, you know, if you crush up oyster shell, crush it into a powder, and then you scatter that, um, on a particular muddy patch, that will attract a lot more baby oysters than, wow. than in the absence of that chemical cue. And what about things like the type of water conditions that are needed for oysters to grow? So, for example, we're doing a project at Ozfish called Pimp My Jetty, which is around hanging like mesh hessian sacks, which are interwoven into kind of long... Um, uh, vertically hanging reefs from a jetty, right? Cool. But, yeah. and it's in its infancy stage, but one of the kind of research, bit of research they're doing around this is making sure that where we hang those, those vertically hanging um, structures, oysters are going to grow on it. And one of the things they're talking about is, is there enough water movement? Is there enough water flow? Is it is it tidal or is it is it brackish water? I've never, truly, I've probably never seen a, an oyster far up in the system. For for example, if I'm fishing a river, they're generally down towards the mouth a little bit. Obviously, in our coastal environments like Moreton Bay and here off Adelaide, you know, that's no problem because they're off the beach. Can an oy- Does an oyster need a certain amount of salinity to grow, water movement, flow, intertidal, you've mentioned? What's what's the prime water conditions for, for an oyster? Depends on the beast, depends on the oyster. Uh, they've got different needs, but salinity is a, a major determinant. And, you know, that's the fascinating thing about working in estuaries where you have those freshwater inputs. Um, an oyster can handle freshwater freshwater conditions for a few days. It, you know, it can clam up, if you'll pardon the pun, um, and and wait to the conditions to to return to uh, an appropriate state for them. Um, but in Sydney Harbour, for example, there's a good example where you've got the invasive Pacific oyster, which is more prevalent on the... Um, upstream uh, because it likes more brackish conditions. It likes slightly more freshwater conditions as opposed to the Sydney rock oyster, which likes slightly more oceanic ones. So you have a gradient where you have more Pacific oysters up, upstream and more um, Sydney rock oysters downstream. So yeah, there's, there's nuances there. And, right. and uh, But I think the take-home message is oysters can deal with a really broad suite of conditions. Yep. And if the conditions aren't good for a few days or weeks, you know, they can shut themselves down and, and sort of wait that out a lot of the time. Mm. Um, so that just makes for a really tough animal that can deal with the highly variable conditions that you get in, in marine, in, um, in estuarine environments. Uh, but yeah, water flow is critical. You want a lot of water flow. When it comes to those coil bags, they're going to be really good. Uh, those coil ropes you're mm. talking about, they're going to be really good for attracting things like mussels, yes. for example, because mussels, you know, <laughs> these these animals, you know, they're really sort of, sim- we think of them as simple animals, but they're able to interpret certain structural cues. So mussels are attracted to environments that reflect the bissel threads that the adult conspecifics, that the that the adults, um, that the adults uh, create habitat with. You know, they have these these hairs. Uh, that's the bissel threads that come out of the mussel to keep them clumped together. And larval mussels will actually be able to sense that and recognise, oh, this is a good place to live because other adults are here. Isn't that interesting? Because over in WA, where they've done this, they're looking to that. Well, this is where Pimp My Jetty started. They've actually, before when they put the rope in, they'll insert one or two mussels in the rope already. There you go. And they found that those particular coils were more productive than the other ones. Yeah. And it just goes to show that you know, in some respect, they're doing a bit of a are calling out to say, hey, I'm already here, come join me. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on. Mm. For, for, forever in the day, it was just considered that recruitment, this arrival of larvae to restock an ecosystem was, was passive, you know, it was just at the whim of the tides that, you know, be potluck that an organism might show up there. But we now know that these, you know, even relatively simple brainless earless microscopic organisms can use scent 
can sense light and use light. Mm. They can sense the structure. They can smell that sort of habitat that they're going to recruit into. And they can even hear, even though they don't have ears. And that's another cue that, that, we, um, that we use for our restoration work. Well, let's dive into it. You've mentioned it. I'm really interested to hear about it because you flagged it on the phone to me offline. So you've done a, you spent a lot of time out in the field and in the lab and, and in your office, obviously, researching these critters and these, these beasts as you've been referring to them. What are some weird and wonderful things you've found out about, about oysters? And, ha- and what has that told us about what we can do to help them? So let's start with the, you know, this hearing phenomenon. Mm, yeah, the other... This is uh, one of the most exciting sort of research avenues that I'm working on at the moment. And uh, it's sort of reflected in, in the attention that this research has generated all around the world because we've been using underwater speakers to attract baby oyster larvae to our restoration sites. Um, even though they don't have ears, they can actually sense and use sound as a cue to find a suitable place to ho- um suitable place to live Uh, that's because they they don't necessarily hear the sound per se they feel it they interpret a component of sound called particle motion or particle acceleration as sound waves move through the water they rattle the little particles around them and that rattling motion actually rattles a particular sensory organism that the that the oyster larvae have and then they can follow gradients in that rattling back to the sound source um, so we've played all sorts of different sounds to, to oyster larvae in the, um, in the lab. Uh, we've played the sounds of sedimentary plains, seagrass, the sounds of degraded, degraded reefs, and the sounds of really healthy rocky reefs. And it's those healthy rocky reefs that are the most attractive. We've also played um, you know, shipping noise, motorboat noise, which, which uh, they don't like at all. Um, unsurprisingly. Yeah, weird. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, weird that. We're not yet to play any Taylor Swift or Barry say, White. Classical, yeah. Yeah, the Eagles. No, uh, okay. it's, yeah. it's coming. It's yeah, coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's the next grant, if I get it. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so the, the, this works phenomenally well. It's, it's ridiculous. How can an organism respond that intensely when it doesn't have a lot of swimming capacity, let's be honest? You know, uh, so. But, but nobody knew that. Nobody knew what we did know. So you mentioned me trawling through the literature. What literature was available prior to this work suggested that when they hear an attractive sound, the oysters will drop out of the water column. They'll sink to the sea floor. Uh, are they swimming or do they have some sort of compensatory bladder? Um, was, un, was uncertain. Or is it sort of like, is that passive motion or are they actively swimming down there? Uh, so what we did is we set up what we called the Oyster Raceway, an eight metre long tank, and we stuck a speaker down one end and nothing at the other, a fake speaker at the other end, um, just to make sure it's scientifically rigorous. And then we dropped thousands and thousands of baby oysters in the middle. So they had a choice, essentially, swim towards the sound or swim away from it. And every single oyster larvae that left that central position swam towards the speaker. And some of them swam over four meters over that 12 hour period that we ran the experiment. And then we repeated it many, many times. Um, and that was quite an astonishing result. It was actually the first time that anyone's shown that these oyster larvae will swim horizontally towards a sound. Was source. there any currents in that tank? Any, no. No, no artificial currents or anything. It was just still water. Yeah. So we were purely just looking at that capacity to yeah. respond to an environmental cue over a certain distance. When you say larvae, they're tiny, right? They're 100 microns. So they're. They're microscopic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Actually, that little thing you've got next to your elbow there, all those little lines are pointing at an oyster larvae. You can't see them without a microscope. Right. They're tiny. So when you say, when you when you were talking about, you know, do they drop out of the waters column and, and go down? We're talking about, t- we're not talking about a, a, an oyster you We're not talking eat. about a rapid dive. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. we're talking about the tiny little babies. Well, once, that's where it starts. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. okay. once they're down, they're down for good. You know, when they find that place that they're going to live, they secrete a little bit of cement and that's it. Um, Interesting. So you can't move. No, can't. no, they're not going anywhere once they're down. Muscles are a little bit different because they have the bissel threads, so they can move a li- around a little bit. But the the oysters uh, essentially gluing its bum to the sea bed, and that's it. It's it's then got to just put up with whatever conditions it's settled on. So it's a big, big decision, and hence it's no surprise that it's been honed by evolution over you know tens of hundreds of millions of years, mm. half a billion years. Uh, that they're really quite capable of using the best environmental information to find a good place to live. 
You'd want to hope your roommate's all right. That's right. That's right. That's why they go for the best party, yeah. where the big, biggest sound is. Right. So uh, what did you gather from it? What, what, what was your conclusion from this exercise that you've done around sound technology? So we were working in the, in the lab, as I mentioned, but then we took that into the field. Mm. And um, you know, there's not a lot of, rec- not, not a lot of money in, in environmental conservation, surprisingly, in this day and age. Um, so, so we had to be creative. And uh, when you want to sort of test something scientifically, you need to replicate it. You need to do it in multiple places at the same time to make sure that you're not just picking up environmental noise. So we couldn't afford a lot of the commercial speakers, but we were able to collaborate with some technology, uh, some engineers, some partners, uh, a little conservation NGO called Oz Ocean, and we built our own speakers for just a few hundred dollars. And then we put them out across two of the largest reef restorations in Australia, um, Windera Reef off the coast of uh, York Peninsula, about 80 k's from where we're sitting right now, and Glenelg Reef, which is um, just a few kilometres from where we're sitting. And we put the speakers at multiple sites across these reefs and found that we had, on average, about five times more oysters settling in the presence of our speakers, but that equated to up to 17,000 more oysters per metre squared when we're playing that sound. That's a phenomenally, um, that's a phenomenal response. And, and so that just meant that if we put a boulder in the water, you know, it's not just oysters that, that want to settle there. And that's how we restore these reefs. We, we lay down hard substrate in the form of limestone boulders first and foremost, because this is quite a hydrodynamically active area. So we can't just put shells down. We need to put something really tough that's not going to move. Um, uh, but how are the oysters going to find it? So we use limestone, so it has some of those cues that it might use, and the speakers have, uh, have demonstrated to work. Uh, but there's all sorts of things looking for a place to live. And what we found when we built the first reefs is they were constructed in the middle of winter, and by the time the oysters started to breed in spring, those reefs are already covered in turfing algae, which form this thick barrier. Um, so the oysters couldn't get onto the reef. So we started building reefs when the oysters were in the water column in springtime. And when we provided that speaker, it meant that the oysters could get bang onto those rocks as quick as possible. And within four months of putting the boulders in the water, the entire boulders were uh, emerging as, as new oyster habitat. So you put the boulder in yep. for, to be the stable, stable substrate. Then yep. you put the, the, the speaker there to attract them there in the first place. How does that help... It's not like you're going to go put thousands of speakers in the water. No. Right? So what? whilst it's cool and, and the, the results you found are awesome, how does that help with like future restoration programs? Because you can't upscale that. You know, you can't go create 100,000 speakers and start dropping no. them in the water. So what, no. what, what, Well, you uh, could fund conservation you, so we don't have to build our yeah, own yeah. speakers. That would be handy. So what was – I guess it's all – so you've come to the conclusion, okay, great, this sound has a role to play, that's all good. Yeah. Now what? Now we need to know how to use it responsibly. Right. Um, and and um, I, I suspect that you would only use... So as these habitats form and emerge, they generate their own sound. So it's probably only going to be useful to use speakers in those first very informative months. Those are the first few months that steer the trajectory of the restoration yeah, along okay. a, pl- a particular path. So if we can get oysters on there immediately... There's a good chance, and we're seeing this, that within a couple of years, you're going to have an oyster reef. Uh, if, you, if, if the oysters get there too late, some of those other reefs, they're still stuck in a sort of turfy state where the oysters just can't get a foothold. So you would use sound at the very beginning, but yeah, you need to know a lot about the, the context, in, in the environmental setting that, that, you're, uh, that you're working in. Mm. Are there invasive species that are also going to recruit to that sound because yeah. there's a lot of things listening and a lot of things that are much more dynamic in their capacity to, to respond to sound. Are you going to bring in fish, which are then going to feast on the oysters and create what we would call a recruitment sink so the oysters can't get a foothold? Right. Uh, to, to manage that, for example, we reduce the sound, uh, the area that we were impacting with sound to just 10 metres. So that sound was highly localized and it's just going to capture the oysters that are floating past and draw them down into the reef. Of course, right. Yeah, so there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of care that needs to be, needs to be taken. But those are the sorts of novel solutions and, and they provide demonstrable evidence that you know, we can bring back an ecosystem 
in a very short period of time, a marine ecosystem, because the because the coastal seas, even when they've been smashed to pieces and they don't look what they looked like when they were pristine, there's still a lot of animals out there with a place looking for a place to live. And mm. So they're quite they're quite fecund systems, even though these reefs couldn't regenerate. They've been waiting for the opportunity to do so, and now we're providing that. And what about some, what what are what other techniques have you come across? So the sounds one. Uh, you know, obviously the one we're going to get to the shellfish revolution, which is the utilizing old shells. What might they be doing in the US that's different? Or what, what, what other techniques have you researched or worked on, which is kind of a, a cool way to restore oysters? A, a way that's very popular and that a lot of people think about is this hatchery breeding of oysters. That's called um, spat on shell, but that's quite an expensive process. But it's something that can be used to supplement low natural recruitment. Um, so that's, that's essentially breeding oysters in, in the lab. Uh, so in, in a hatchery, providing them with shell, spat on shell, the little baby oysters settle on the shell, then you outplant that on the reef. Um, that's a common technique, but I would only advocate for that if it was absolutely critical, if there weren't natural propagules out there in the system, natural oyster larvae settling, uh, because that was done on these first few reefs and, and at you know, substantial expense, they planted several million oysters. Uh, but we had several hundred million oysters naturally recruit anyway. So um, there's going to be different needs for different reefs and different settings. And uh, keying into those different cues seems like a really good way to attract the target or organism, which is the oyster. Um, but yeah, it's really about understanding, you know, where these reefs were historically is probably a good benchmark. Yeah, you can't just go put these anywhere. That's They've right. They've got to be strategically placed because that's, you know, that's the best conditions. If they're there naturally, then if I re we restore there, then great, they're going to, you know, the yeah. conditions are going to be right. That that legitimizes the, the mm. process of restoration. They used to be here. But we need to be careful in this day and age with rapid, really rapid environmental change. Maybe those conditions aren't suitable aren't anymore. anymore. Um, so those are the things we need to know. So we need to know about the water quality mm. and movement, hydrodynamics, and we need to know about you know, the, the density of surviving oysters. Are there brooding stocks still out there in the water? Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what about, so what about this idea of taking old shells, chucking them in a, you know, some type of structure and then deploying those back? Is that, you know, of course you've, you know, of, of Robbie and, and his team and what they're doing up, up in Moreton Bay. Was that something that when you first heard of it, you were kind of like, yeah, this is, this is cool. This is innovative. Giddy up. Particularly for the fact that it's community driven. Yeah. No, it, it's awesome. Let's touch on that for a second. So, we're taking a method. Firstly, does the method work? But then, B, how cool is it that it's it's driven by Billy, John, Steve, you know, Alicia, yeah. whoever in the community. You know, you just your average Joe Blow. Yeah, yeah. So, in terms of um, it working, uh, it it looks really successful. You know, within a few years, because you're providing, you're keeping. With the frame, you're keeping those shells consolidated so they're not moving around in the water column. So you can put these structures in, you know, quiet, energetic uh, environments. And the oysters can get in there, find shelter. And we've also been deploying them here in um, in uh, South Australia, in the Port River, which looks like a, you know, it's not the most attractive environment. But put these, um, put these, uh, uh, Ausfish, put these, these structures in, and within four months, they're full of fish, they're full of crabs, and the oysters are recruiting. So the oysters can find it and use it really quickly. And over a few years, as Robbie was uh, telling me last time I saw him, the, that structure is then consolidated and the mesh can, can corrode away and will leave that oyster reef sitting there, which is really, really exciting. Uh, that technique, slightly different design, is also being used in the Hudson River now, I've, I've seen recently. And there's also been there's experiments um, off the coast of, uh, in the Wadden Sea, so off the coast of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. they're, they're using similar gabion cages. So it's catching. It's catching it's, big it's, time. Yeah, it's expanding. So for someone that, you know, I like to offer something for the skeptics. So for someone looking at this and going, oh, you're just, you're dropping old, just basically old used shells out there. Obviously, they're, they're sterilized and they're, you know, dried out in the sun and things like that. You can confidently say that that method is working, has worked and will work in terms of restoring shellfish in Australia. Yeah, it's the best possible substrate you could use because it is a sustainable substrate. It's a waste product that uh, from oyster farms and, 
And in the past, oyster farmers have actually had to pay to have that uh, discarded on, on landfills. And, and around the world, that equates to billions of ton or a lot of tonnage of oyster shell and other bivalve shell being being thrown onto landfill when it could be returned to the sea to provide suitable substrate for restoration. Mm. Uh, it's about obviously supply and demand. There's not too many uh, oyster worlds, uh, Ozfish oyster worlds around around the country yet. But I'm really hoping and optimistic that they that they are going to catch on, and it's really exciting to see it here in South Australia because I see that as a critical component for moving restoration forward from some sort of you know slightly esoteric piecemeal thing with with projects here and there most of them top-down government driven a lot of them a lot of the large ones to see really large community-led projects emerging in a sustainable manner where where mums dads kids and grandmas can get involved and and enjoy the thrill and excitement of of being mm. involved in a restoration project is really exciting in particularly in this era of you know full of eco anxiety um and you know people feeling massive distress over the state of the planet the opportunity to be engaged in restoration is a is a process of healing not just for nature for but for humans as well Oh, so you said, yeah, so it's not just a, a benefit in getting a few reefs out there, but you think it's actually benefiting them, their mental state, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, restoration embodies shared values of people, uh, and that's a really important part of, of the pro process. It's not just about what's going in the water. It's the process from the beginning uh, all the way to the end, and, mm. and, and there isn't an end point either. You know, these are ecosystems that will hopefully be... Um, engaged with by society, by communities for decades to come, by multiple generations. But it is really important to have a lot of people involved in these restorations. Mm. So they're not out of sight, out of mind. So they're actually on people's agenda, you know. So it might be my my hope, my vision for the future is, is a, a more developed, widespread culture of ecosystem restoration where Coast, you know, it's a normal part of coastal living. You spend part of your weekend getting involved in a restoration project or a conservation project, giving something back. I think eco anxiety was that that stood out for me when you said that. Then it's so true. People have this. Well, yeah, it's not it's not a fear, I think, but it's a it's an awareness now that something needs to be done and that things are changing. And it's to me, I reckon it's a new a, a new thing. It's, it's not. Uh, it wasn't around when you know my dad was. No, coming no. up, coming up the ranks. It's certainly something for our generation only. What, what are your thoughts on that? What, uh, and particularly the uh, slightly younger generation, mm. uh, you know, kids in school at the moment. Eco anxiety is a very real mental health challenge, mental health issue. Because as you know, if you watch the nightly news, we get absolutely bombarded by terrible news. And there are a lot of very positive news stories, but. Let's not be, let's not sugarcoat it. You know, the, the, the state of the environment is extremely distressing. Um, but in recognizing that it is in a state of massive disrepair, there's also an opportunity at, and that we have solutions through things like ecosystem restoration to, to turn that around. You know, we are at an, an exciting time, but people aren't going to recognize that unless they're actually aware and hopefully getting involved because spending time in nature, as we know, is, is very good for our mental health. And what better way than to spend repairing that ecosystem and then seeing the fruits of your labor within a few years. Mm. It's one of the exciting things about marine restoration, I think, because, you know, it can take decades or 100 years to restore a forest to, to an old growth state. Just off the shore here, we've built an oyster reef that's two and a half years old. And the density of oysters is already surpassing that of our only natural remaining natural reef um, for these flat oysters, which is down in Tasmania, completely eradicated from the mainland, hardly any oysters left, can't, can barely find a single oyster, but you put boulders in the sea floor and within a matter of years, you can return that ecosystem from functional extinction. So the success rate is high, can be high. Oh, well, it can be high, it can be high, it's highly variable. So we've yep. got many, we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, large reefs now here in South Australia. So we're in a really sort of privileged position yeah. to be able to look at the nuances surrounding each of those reefs. 
And some of them are absolutely flourishing, as I say, within a matter of years, return from functional extinction. Some of them are limping along. So um, it's important that we that we recognize the bright spots, but also the far, mm. you know, the journey that we're on. And, and uh, we're still at the beginning of that journey. Would you agree with the statement that the last 10 years has really seen a shift in how the community views the importance of restoring uh, our aquatic habitats? Or well, not just, you know, also the you know, forest and things like that, yeah. but we're in the aquatic world. Um, I've always loved the conversation around how in, say, two or three decades' time, people will be talking about 2012 to 2025 as that real pivotal moment when a lot of these conversations kicked off. Do you think we're living in that right now? Oh, absolutely. It's recognised in global policies to turn things around in our human nature relationship, uh, emphasised by the decade on ecosystem restoration 2021 to 2030. But you've also got the decade of United Nations decade on ocean science for, mm. a, sustainable, for a sustainable future. And a lot of other globally recognised multinational agendas to, to, to change the way we use value nature and and, mm. and how we manage it so absolutely i think this is a turning point um i uh I, and i'm very optimistic and very privileged to well to work in an optimistic space in working with an ecosystem that we can bring back uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what the future holds and you know we, with with the rise of, of of donald trump and examples like that emerging around the world where environmental issues can be completely quickly relegated to the hodgepods of, of um, politics mm. uh, yeah there's no there's no certainty about about the sustainability of our future but I'm hopeful and I think this this is a turning point I don't want to give uh, too much light to things like criticism but one of the things I've read to kind of round us out today on on social media is around this idea that certain that you know we call them robs but you know these, these uh, you know, efforts to restore shellfish reefs, where it be a, a, a triangular prism shield filled with old shells or boulders, whatever, can attract certain things like uh, worms or other crustaceans that aren't considered, you know, great. Um, the one that keeps popping up uh, for the shellfish revolution is this flatworm farms basically you know some people saying that all we're doing is fostering you know hmm. a place for yeah. for other critters to live that we don't want to live how do you respond to that and can you kind of distill that issue a little bit so people can understand what may you know some critics might have to say about some of these restoration efforts i, I think the first thing that that jumps to mind it's, it's it's funny how humans feel they have the the need to pass judgment mm. on, on what is a good species and what's a bad species. And obviously, yeah, you because know, those are human fabricated concepts. You know, we, we badger species as alien and, and all of a sudden it strikes fear and, uh, into us. Um, but you can't control nature to the degree that, we, that some people would like. And marine ecosystems in particular are incredibly dynamic systems. So what you can do is try to restore native biodiversity. And the reefs that we're restoring are native reefs, which have their own native associated biodiversity with them, which includes predators, which are gonna eat things which we consider a pest. Um, so I would say that if you're, yes, there is a real genuine risk of spreading invasive species. That's something that we shouldn't sugarcoat, but that's why you need research and monitoring. And you need it to be long-term and meaningful and done in a standardised way so we can make sure that we're learning from our successes and our mistakes. And mistakes are okay so long as we're recognising them and adapting because they're inevitable. You know, this isn't physics or some easy discipline like that. This is ecology. This is nature, mm. which is the most dynamic thing we can think about. You, know, you can't control everything. And... Whereas, you know, we have this thriving native reef restored offshore here. Who's to say all those oysters aren't going to keel over and die with some sort of catastrophic climate-driven event or, or, mm. or non-climate event? Um, so we need to be dynamic and open-minded because ecosystems are in a constant state of flux. Mm. That's one of the things you recognise as, as, uh, as, an, as an ecologist.
um, and restorations will will change. But if we can focus on bringing back native biodiversity and those associated communities, then that's our best chance yeah. of improving the resilience and health of our coastal seas. I think monitoring the big one there. Like you said, if you, if you start to see something going wrong or whatnot, then you can change what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so, for, yeah, for, I think it's interesting. You, we should always address those, yeah. those critics or those criticisms because... Um, yeah, we shouldn't ignore you them. You shouldn't ignore them. Yeah, you don't Absolutely. want to just talk about the positives all the time because there are some negatives involved yeah. in some of these things. And the more we address them and make them transparent, then you know we're educated on them, people know more about them, and then you know it's a circular system. So. There's this arrogance that we seem we're supposed to project that we know everything. Mm. We don't. We're working in a vacuum a lot of the time. Uh, but we're trying to work with nature. We're collaborating with oysters in this circumstance and all the other marine critters mm -hmm. that improve the health of the ecosystem and our own lives mm -hmm. as well. For, perfect. Hey, listen, that's a, a pretty comprehensive chat on oysters considering yeah. there's only... You know, oh, I can go deeper. You could go longer. How much time have you got? Yeah, well, <laughs> I think we might be doing a, uh, a few parts on this particular one. But um, look, we've touched there on the history, um, how much we've lost, you know, how we've lost it. Um, into some of the, I guess, uh, nuances of oysters themselves in, in how they interact with each other and what, what the perfect conditions are, and then, you know, transitioned into the restoration techniques and methods. Um, is there anything else you want to kind of add on as a part of your journey, things you've found out, those weird and wacky things to kind of take us out here? Is, or are you happy to... To, oh, to, geez, leave, to leave right. it there is, uh, this is kind of your, your open floor to, to maybe cover something that you would you wanted to cover I could go off on all sorts of, of tangents. tangents here isn't that um, isn't that interesting when you're so you're so honed into a particular topic you, you, there's so many different avenues you could go down yeah yeah so for example with, with you know so oysters have been used in the past as a hallucinogenic um, in, really in South America for hundreds of years, people used oysters, a particular type of oyster, the spiny oyster. They're a very sexy oyster. Um, that is this, a good-looking oyster. Well, this isn't the best example, but, yeah, they can be bright red with horn spikes coming off them. And people thought it was the food of the gods, and by eating them, uh, they could talk to God, allow them to get closer to God. In actual fact, what we think was happening is... Uh, uh, on this particular stretch of Pacific South American coastline where you have toxic algal blooms, the oysters at a certain time of year would eat that toxic algae. Um, but the, the local communities would dive down to sort of 10, 20, even 30 metres to collect these oysters to eat them, which is phenomenal. And that goes back several hundred years. Wow. Hallucinogenic oysters. Yeah, party food. <laughs> yeah, party food, exactly. And... Um, is is the majority of your time spent in the office or out on the field? Uh, well, as I, um, these days I'm more chained to my desk, yes. unfortunately. Right. I'd rather be out there diving, uh, yeah. but most of the time now my, my students are, are out diving on the reefs and mm. seeing all sorts of wonderful, wacky things. Um, I'm busy writing papers and trying to keep my head afloat in this hyper competitive yep. stressful industry right. uh, but but I um, I get out whenever I can well to, to, to finish us off take us back to one of the times when you've been able to put the goggles on the mask on and dive down and see what some of your work or research be successful I'm, I'm envisaging you in the boat on the top of the, the the water surface about to dive down to check if one of your reefs has, has started to recolonize you get down there and it's kind of like it's worked you know and i've i've tried to ask that penny dropping moment to, to every guest we've got on this platform just to take us in the insight uh, you know give us some insight into the world of of someone who's who's trying to make a difference so has has there been a moment like that for you well a couple of months ago i dived uh, on glenelg and um yeah i mean my jaw would have hit the floor if it could have because mm. it was yeah, that was a moment of realization that you know this is back from the dead this right. ecosystem can be viewed nowhere else on mainland Australia because it was eradicated. But now here we have it. After just two and a half years, that's that's outrageous. And it will continue to grow and change. And mm. uh, But, to, yeah, that was a very, very special moment. May 2023, 
to know that it worked. Yep. And I'll be getting out there as soon as I can. Very good. Well, uh, we might do a part two on this down the track, check in with what you've been doing. Until then, thank you so much for jumping on. It's been a fantastic chat. Yeah. And uh, yeah, hopefully someone who's listening to this might just uh, get a bit of a kick of motivation to go either join a, a community driven program near you or, you know, start one yourself. Who knows? Absolutely. Do it. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming. Anytime. Thank you.